So as was mentioned, my name is Dr. Rebecca Avart. I am a current PGY1 resident at Sanford Health in Fargo, and I would like to talk to you today regarding um, statin-associated musculoskeletal symptoms, commonly known as SAMs. First off, there's no disclosures or relevant finance relationships with ineligible companies for me to disclose at this time. Some objectives I hope you get from today's didactic session is to be able to describe and explain the pathophysiology of statin-induced myaldas and rhabdomyolysis, and then a review of the 2022 CPIC guideline update on statin-associated musculoskeletal symptoms related to the SCLO1B1 gene specific. Moving through some of the different background on statin use and its place in therapy in the US. So first, cardiovascular disease or CVD is one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in the United States. According to the CDC, over 750,000 people died of heart disease, stroke, or other cardiovascular diseases every year. Cholesterol-lowering medications have a high prevalence of use in the US. And in 2019, there was an estimated 20 or 92 million Americans on some form of statin therapy. Per guidelines, many people qualify for statin use, and including those for primary and secondary prevention of coronary arteries or heart disease. Just a run through of what statin therapies are currently available. We have atorvastatin, simvastatin, and resuvastatin which these three drugs are routinely in our top 20 of all drugs prescribed in the United States. We also have lovastatin, pravastatin, and fluvastatin. And statin class as a whole is remained the number one prescribed medication class in the U.S. Statin intolerances and side effects are a main limiting factor for use and dose optimization for patients. Skeletal muscle toxicities is likely dose dependent and commonly presents as these statin associated musculoskeletal symptoms or SAMs. SAMs can present in a range of severities, starting with myalgias, which can be muscle pain, aching, cramps, and they again are among the most common manifestation of SAMs. Symptoms are typically bilateral and involve large muscle groups, which can include the thigh, back, shoulders, and often symptoms appear early upon initiation of therapy or a dose increase. Myopathies could encompass muscle weaknesses that are outside of the causes of muscle pain. This also presents with or without changes in our serum monitoring values, such as a creatinine kinase level, which is a marker of muscle breakdown. And finally, rhabdomyolysis is the severe muscle breakdown with renal dysfunction or acute kidney injury. This is characterized clinically by a triad of myalgias, muscle weakness, and a red to brown urine called myoglobinuria. Biochemically, several serum muscle enzymes are elevated, including the creatinine kinase, but the degree of muscle pain and other symptoms can vary widely. Overall, myalgias and Myopathies, muscle weakness can resolve and serum threatening kinase concentrations can return to normal over days to weeks after discontinuation of the drug. Let's dive into some of the specific mechanisms or possible pathways for statin-induced muscle damage. So statins act on the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme as an inhibitor which blocks the downstream pathways all linked to cholesterol synthesis. These pathways are needed for synthesis of the cell membrane and other cellular degradation courses that clear intracellular debris and other pathways. Statin inhibition can result in this toxic accumulation and free oxygen mediated cellular damage. This combination with a plethora of other endogenous and exogenous factors can result in the presentation of SAMs. So let's take a deeper dive into the most severe SAMS presentation, which would be rhabdomyolysis. 
The diagnosis for rhabdomyolysis is typically one of exclusion with a few specific manifestations that are unique to rhabdo. As mentioned previously, those triad of symptoms include the myalgia, weakness, myoglobinuria, which are all established factors for criteria in rhabdomyolysis. However, there are estimates that place that this triad only manifests in roughly 10% of patients that are ever diagnosed with rhabdomyolysis. And although there is no definitive diagnostic criteria, rhabdo is typically diagnosed with a creatinine kinase level that is 10 times greater than the upper limit of normal. With the addition of evidence of renal compromise and without causes of other muscle injury or things that could associate with increases. That kidney dysfunction piece can uh, be seen through dark colored urine, which is categorized as red to brown, tea colored, orange, cola colored. And this is one of the classic signs of myoglobinuria within rhabdo. How this process works is myoglobin, a heme creating containing respiratory protein is released from damaged muscle in parallel with creatinine kinase. And myoglobin is not significantly protein bound and thus is rapidly excreted from the urine, which this results in that red to brown um, urine output. One thing to note is serum creatinine kinase begins to rise roughly two to 12 hours following the onset of muscle injury. So we can see that temporal relationship there and it reaches its maximum peak roughly 24 to 72 hours later. This decline is usually seen up to five days post cessation of whatever's causing muscle injury and declines at a relatively consistent rate of approximately 50% of the previous day's value. So another factor that plays into the development of SAMs and rhabdomyolysis and other statin intolerances includes genomic information. The Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, or CPIC, has established guidelines with specific genotypic and statin-associated musculoskeletal symptoms in mind. Um, this update was from 2022. Some of the specific genes implicated in the S include the SLC. O1B1 gene, and this encodes for the SLCO1B1 transporter, which facilitates hepatic uptake of statins. There are dosing and use recommendations within these guidelines for nearly all statins relating to this gene function. Other genes include, in the new updates, the ABCG2, which encodes the ATP binding cassette, or G, um, G2, which is expressed in the liver, the blood-brain barrier, and the intestines. This facilitates the export of compounds into the extracellular space, and guideline recommendations are only available for resuvastatin specifically to this gene. Another gene that the guidelines address is the CYP2C9 gene. This, of course, encodes for the CYP2C9 enzyme and plays a role in many phase one metabolic pathways. CPIC, again, has dosing and use recommendations only for fluvastatin regarding the CYP2C genome. Mm -hmm. The SLC-01B1 transporter is a transmembrane protein that is responsible for transporting statins into the extracellular space, or into the intracellular space where they are broken down by an additional cascade of enzymes to both active and inactive metabolites. As you can see, alterations in the function of this specific transporter can result in differing systemic exposures to statin concentration. The phenotypic expression of each genotype for the SLC-01B1 gene can be found within the CPIC guidelines. Statin toxicities occur with the decreased and poor functioning phenotypes. For the most part, these are categorized as individuals with one non-functioning allele or no functioning alleles, respectively. Mm -hmm. 
Guidelines also provide use and dosage guidance for statins relating to the genotypic information of the SLC01B1 gene. For all statins with normal function phenotype, the standard recommended doses for each disease-specific guideline is appropriate here. The largest impact of recommendations will come into play with our poor functioning phenotypic group. For lovastatin, it is recommended to find an alternative option for statin treatment. For pravastatin, a dose of less than or equal to 40 milligrams can be used as a starting dose, again, adjusting from there based on guideline recommendations. Additionally, for rosuvastatin in this group, there are dosing recommendations less than or equal to 20 milligrams as a starting dose. And simvastatin, like lovastatin, has a recommendation of alternative statin therapy depending on desired potency. The final one I'll address here is atorvastatin, which would be recommended with a starting dose of less than 20 milligrams, and again, continuing to adjust as needed. Having the genetic information available, especially initiation of treatment, can help navigate appropriately, help prevent toxicities, including SAMs, and optimize eff efficacy. The CPIC guidelines provide a visual representation of these different recommendations based on each statin. This diagram here recommend, shows the recommendations based off of those decreased function phenotypes of the SLC01B1 gene. The light gray boxes describe the recommended starting dose. Those dark gray boxes then indicate an increased risk and how the provider should be aware of the possibility of that increased exposure and risk of SAMs. And then finally, the black boxes is where you would consider that dose reduction or alternative therapy. As you can see, when we move down to the poor functioning phenotypes, this diagram from the CPIC guidelines shows that more therapies have moved into those dark gray and black boxes, again, with recommendations for dose changes and alternative therapies. There are a variety of other factors at play outside of genetics to keep in mind when evaluating the risk for SAMs, which can be compounded within that genetic picture. Some endogenous factors include an advanced age greater than 80 years old, a lower BMI with less muscle mass, any pre-existing muscle condition, a related or, or a different level of liver or renal dysfunction, that can alter those metabolic or excretion pathways. And finally, hypothyroidism is another metabolic risk factor in the increased opportunities of manifestation of SAMs on statin therapies. Exogenous factors include strenuous exercise, which enhances muscle breakdown, vitamin D deficiency, of course, our medications, um, but also could include others that cause drug-drug interactions with our statin therapies that results again in that compounding risk. And additionally, excessive alcohol intake can have effects on the liver, adding to the metabolic pathway problems that can enhance SAMs. Some key takeaways from today are that statins are some of the most prescribed drugs in the United States. There are three statins currently in that top 20 individual drugs prescribed, and statins as a class are the number one class prescribed within the U.S. These medications have a great profile for improving cardiovascular outcomes, and many individuals will qualify to be on statin here. Statin intolerances, such as muscle-involved side effects, are a primary reason for hesitation in the initiation of statin therapies, the inability to reach optimized doses or intensity of statins desired, and the discontinuation overall of statin therapy. CPIC offers guidelines regarding statin use with specific genes that can help assist in recommendations for these statin uses and doses. And finally, within those guidelines, the SLC01B1 gene has the most implementation and recommendations for most statin use. Thank you, and what questions do you have today?